You know, there were tabloid stories around the time that he got arrested that were really fixated on, you know, the stealing of this crown jewel out of the castle in Austria. And it just sounds like this sort of fairy tale, you know, James Bond-esque heist, the way that the story has been told over and over again and, you know, piqued my interest. So I, I went back to just dig a little bit more and Googled this guy and just realized what a well there is. I mean, he you know, went on this decades long crime spree with just each kind of escapade and each heist and each scheme just more elaborate and more complex than the last. So just completely intrigued by the character and, you know, spent spent quite a while trying to track him down and put the pieces together. Gerald actually in the documentary, explain how why he's not in jail, because that took me a minute to process. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> It's a very good question. I was shocked by that. I mean, I think when I came across this story, you know, you figure he's serving a life sentence somewhere. Um, but, you know, I guess a short answer is just that the Canadian penal system is not nearly as um, extreme, I guess, as the American justice system. I mean, I think these same crimes would have carried a much harsher sentence in the U.S. But, you know, and talk to him, you know, I think he will he'll kind of tell you that he was very calculating about which crimes he chose to do. And the fact that he, you know, didn't do any violent crimes, the fact that he never carried a weapon, um, the fact that he almost always, you know, acted alone. Um, a lot of these things really, you know, just because of the way the law works in Canada, you know, didn't carry very heavy sentences. Um, and he was, you know, not to give too much away in the film, but um, he was very smart about the way he handled his legal interests, <laughs> I will say. And I think it was a big, huge turning point in his life, you know, as a teenager to be arrested in the United States, serve real hard prison time, you know, as a minor, um, and ultimately be deported to Canada. You know, I think that that gave him a, a very vested interest in in thinking about how he pursued his his criminal career. <laughs> it, didn't, it certainly didn't seem to slow him down at all, but he, no. he was much more sophisticated about it. And you know, again, to hear him tell it, he sort of always knew he was going to be arrested and he was sort of laying his, you know, playing his cards to lessen his sentence once that actually happened. I mean, he is so alarmingly smart. I can't believe like the FBI hasn't or the CIA hasn't like didn't like see this kid and scoop him up. It is kind of amazing, honestly. And he has these almost kind of savant like skills you know to to break codes and to you know beat systems um but I, one of my favorite lines in the film one of the police says you know just how could somebody so smart be so dumb you know that he will spend a year you know planning this perfect heist at a bank and walk out with half a million dollars and then the next day he's smacking or strapping smoke bombs to his chest and sawing into an atm you know it's almost like different urges i think yeah, there was there was a side of him that's just very careful and very calculating and another side that just needed that thrill you know really wanted that thrill of the chase and sort of wanted an audience a lot of it has to do with youth yeah <laughs> you know what i mean a lot of it has to be like let's go blow up a mailbox you know <laughs> right. the law enforcement you spoke to seemed to have this sort of reverence for him because of his patience i mean then they admit to under estimating him. 